From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. Uh, we're at our Palo Alto studio today as kind of our ongoing leadership coverage of, of what's happening with the COVID crisis and really looking uh, out into our community to find experts who can provide tips and tricks and, and some guidance as everyone is kind of charting, you know, these uncharted waters, if you will. And we've got a great uh, Cube alum in our database. He's a fantastic resource. So we're excited to get him on, share the information with you. And we'd like to welcome once again, Darren Murph. He is the head of remote for GitLab. Darren. Great to see you. Absolutely, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So thank you. And um, you know, first off, we had you on earlier this year, back when things were normal uh, and kind of a regular interview. Who knew that you would be at the center of the work from home universe just a few short months later? I mean, you've been doing this forever. So as, as kind of a wily old veteran uh, of kind of the work from home, or not even from home, just work from someplace else. Um, what are some top level things that you can share for people that have never experienced this before? Yeah, uh, on the working front, if you are one of the people that are working from home, I think there's a couple of things you can do to help acclimate and make your world a little bit better. And the first is to try to create some sort of separation between your work life and your personal life. Now, if you have a home big enough that you can dedicate a workspace to being your office, that's going to help a lot. Help focus standpoint and just you don't want those lines between work and life to blur too much. That's where isolation kicks in. That's where burnout kicks in. You want to do whatever you can to avoid. It. You got to remember when you're not physically walking out of an office and disconnecting from work, you have to replicate that and recreate that. I actually recommend for people that used to have a commute and now they don't, I would actually block something in your calendar, whether that's cooking, cleaning, spending time with your family, resting more, anything so that you ramp into your day very deliberately and ramp out of it. Period deliberate. Now, on the team leading front, uh, I was gonna, I'm gonna say that it, it may feel a little counterintuitive, but the further your team is from you, the more distributed are they are, the more you really need to, to let go and allow them to have a mechanism for feeding back to you. A manager's job in a remote setting switches from just being a pure director to actually being an unblocker and a really active listener. And for people that have gotten to a certain point in their career through command and control, this is going to feel very strange, jarring and counterintuitive, but we've seen it time and time again. You need to trust that your workers are in a new environment. You have to give them a mechanism feeding back to you so you can help them unblock whatever it is. You know, it's funny, we had someone on as, as part of this the other day talking about, you know, uh, leaders need to change their, their objectives that they're managing to from kind of activity based to to deliverables based and, and it actually yeah. floored me that someone is still writing in a blog in 2020 that people have to change their management deliverables from activity to uh, deliverables. And it was so funny, you know, you had Martin Mikos on, we had him on too. And he, <laughs> my yeah. favorite comment was, it's so easy to fake it in the office and look busy, but when you're at home, all you have is your deliverable. So it really, it seems like this kind of a forcing function to get people to pay attention to the things they should be managing to anyway. You said it, forcing functions. I talk about this all the time, but there are so many forcing functions in remote that help you do remote well, but not only just do remote well, just run your business well. Even if you plan on going back to the office on some level, there's a lot of things you can do now to kind of pave the infrastructure, for creating a better, more effective team. And as a manager, if you haven't been writing down the metrics or expectations for your direct reports in the office, now's the time to do it subjectivity is allowed to flourish in the office. You can praise or promote people just kind of how much you like them or how easy they are to work with. That really has nothing to do with metrics and results that you're driving. I've often been asked, well, how do you know if someone's working remotely? And my response is, how do you know if they were working in the office? If you can't clearly answer that in the office, then you're not going to be able to answer it remotely. So frankly, in these times, a lot of the burden falls more on the manager to actually take a, a hard look at what they are clarifying to their team. And if the metrics aren't laid out, it's on the manager to lay that out. It's not the responsibility of the, the direct report to figure out how to prove their worth. The manager has to be very articulate about what that value looks like. Right. And not only do they have to be articulate about what the deliverables are and what, what their expectations are, but um, you guys have a remote playbook, a, a 
GitLab has published, which is terrific. People should go online. There's 38 pages of dense, dense, dense material. Uh, so it's a terrific resource. It's open source. You got to love the open source ethos. But one of the slides that jumped out to me, and it's, it's consistent with a lot of these conversations that we're having, is that your frequency of communications when people are not in the same room together has to go up dramatically, which is a little counterintuitive, but what I found even more interesting was the variety uh, of types of communication, not just your kind of standard meeting or your sta standard status on a project or maybe a little bit of a, of, a, of a look forward to some strategic stuff, but you outlined a whole variety of types of communication objectives or methods or um, feel, if you will, to help people yeah. stay connected and to help you know, kind of keep this team building going forward. So here's the thing about communication. You've got to be intentional about it in a remote setting. And in fact, you need to have more intentionality across the board in a remote setting. And communications is just a very obvious. One. So for a lot of companies, they leave a lot of things to kind of spontaneity and faith. Interpersonal relationships and communications are two of the biggest ones where you may not actually lay out a plan for how work is communicated about or what opportunities you give people to chat about their weekends or sports or anything like that. You just kind of put them in the same building and then people just kind of figure it out. In a remote setting, that's unwise. You're going to get a lot of chaos and dysfunction when people don't know how to communicate and on what channel. So at GitLab, we're very prescriptive that work communication happens in a GitLab issue or a merge request. And then informal communication happens through Zoom calls, or Slack. We actually expire our Slack messages after 90 days specifically to force people not to do work in Slack. We want the work to begin where it needs to end up. And in that case, it's a very, uh, it's a tool, GitLab, that's built for asynchronous communication. And we want to continue to encourage that bias towards asynchronous communication. So yeah, we write down everything about how we want people to communicate and through what channels. And that may sound like a lot of rules, but actually it's very much appreciated by a global team. We have over 1,200 people in more than 65 countries and they all just need to know where communication is going to happen. Right. And our team is really cohesive and on the same page because we're articulate about it. So I want to double down on that, uh, on the asynchronous piece, because you brought this up, or you and Stu brought it up in your conversation with Stu. And Stu raised an interesting point, right? That unfortunately in the day of email and connected phones and this and that, there has there has grown an expectation. It used to be, you know, kind of business, business, uh, uh, okay was I'll get back to you within 24 hours, right? If you leave me a voicemail. Um, yeah. And Lord knows what it was when we were still typing letters and memos and sticking stuff in the the, the, the yellow envelopes with the string, right? It was multiple days. Yeah. But somehow that all, all got changed to, I need to hear back from you now. And, and often it feels like, you know, if, if you're trying to have just some uninterrupted work time to get something done, it's like, why is your lack of planning suddenly, you know, my emergency? And you talked about, you can't operate that on a global asynchronous team because everyone's in different time zones and just by rule, there are going to be a lot of people that are not awake when you need the answer to that question. But, but that you've developed a culture that that's okay and that that is kind of the flow and the pacing, which, which A, forces people to ask in advance, not immediately when you need it, but also gives people unfettered time to actually plan to do work versus plan to answer communications. I wonder if you can dig into how did that evolve and, and how do you enforce that when somebody comes in from the outside world? The real key to that is something that might not be immediately apparent to everyone, which is at GitLab, we try to shift as much burden as we possibly can humans to documentation. And this even starts at onboarding, where to get onboarded at GitLab, you get an onboarding issue within GitLab with over 200 checkboxes of things to read and knowledge assessments to take. And humans are a part of it, but very minimal compared to what most companies would do. And the thing that you just outlined was, we, we're talking about asking questions. We're tapping someone on the shoulder to fill in a knowledge gap. But at GitLab, we want to write everything down in a very formalized, structured way. We try to work handbook first. So we need to document all of our processes, protocols, and solutions. Basically, everything that we've ever seen or done needs to be documented in the handbook. So it's not that GitLab team members are just magically need less information. It's just that instead of having to ask someone or a team, we go ask the handbook. We go consult the documentation. And the more rich that your documentation is, the less you have to bother other people 
and the less you need to rely on synchronicity. So for us, it all starts with operating handbook first. That allows our humans to reserve their cycles for doing truly creative things, not just answering a question for the thousand times. Right. Another thing you, you covered, which I, which I really um, enjoyed was uh, getting senior executives uh, to work from home for an extended period of time. Now, obviously before COVID, that would probably be a lot harder to do. Well, now COVID right. has forced that. And, and I think to your, your, your point about that is it really forces the empathy uh, for someone who had no interest in working from home, didn't like to work from home, loves going to the office, has a routine, been doing it for, for decades, to kind of wake up to, A, uh, you, need, you need to have more empathy for what this is all about, and, and B, what's it all about by actually you know, you know, doing it. So I wonder, you know, kind of your take in the, the movement for, to more of a, of a work from anywhere future, now that all the senior executives have been thrown into this uh, you know, work from home situation. Well, look, Jeff, you never want to waste a crisis. We can't wish away the crisis that's in front of us, but we can choose how we respond to it. And this does present an opportunity to lay groundwork, to lay infrastructure, to build a more remote, fluent organization. And I have absolutely advocated for companies to get their leadership teams out of the office for a meaningful amount of time, a month, ideally a quarter, so that they actually understand what the remote life is. They actually have some of those communication gaps and challenges so they can document what's happening and then help fix it. But to your point, executives love going to the office because they're on a different playing field to begin with. They usually have an executive assistant. Things are just, there's less friction in general. So it behooves them to just kind of keep charging in that direction. But now what we have is a situation where all of those executives are remote. And I'm seeing a lot of them say, you know what, I'm seeing the myths that I have perpe uh, perpetrated break down in, in front of me. And this is even in the most suboptimal time ever to go remote. This isn't remote work. This is crisis-induced work from home. We're all dealing with social isolation. Our parents are also doubling as homeschool teachers. We have a lot going on. And even on top of all of that, I'm amazed at how adaptable the, the, the human uh, society has been in in just adjusting to this and figuring it out on the fly. And I think the companies that take this opportunity to ask themselves the right question and build this into their ongoing talent and operational strategy will actually come out stronger on the other side. Yeah, as you said, this is as challenging as it's ever been. There was no, there was no planning ahead. Your, your spouse or significant other is also working from home and has the same right. Zoom schedule as you do for some strange reason, right? The kids are home, as you said, and you're homeschooling them and they also have to get on Zoom to do their the classes. So it's really suboptimal. But, uh, but as you said, it's a forcing function and people are going to learn. W one of the other yes. things in your, in your handbook is the kind of definitions. It's not just work from home or work at the office, but there's actually a continuum and a spectrum. And, you know, as people are doing this for weeks uh, and months and, you know, behaviors turn into habits, you know, people are not going to want to go back to sitting on 101 for two hours every morning to go work on a laptop in the office. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense. So as you kind of look, forward, um, you know, how do you see kind of the evolution? How, how you know, are, are people taking baby steps, if you will, you know, to incorporate more of this learning as we go forward and incorporate into more of their regular everyday, you know, kind of procedures? I'm really optimistic about the future because what I see happening here is people are unlocking their imaginations. So once they've kind of stabilized, they're starting to realize, hey, I'm getting a lot more time with my family. I'm spending a lot less gas. I just feel better as a person because I don't show up to work every day with road rage. So how can I keep this going? And I genuinely think what's going to happen in four or five months, we're going to have millions of people collectively look at each other and they say, you know, the boss just called me back into the office, but I just did my job from home, even in suboptimal conditions. I saw my family more, I exercised more, I had more time to cook and clean. How about no? I'm not going to go back to the office as my default location. And I think what's going to happen is the 80-20 rule is going to flip. Right now, people work from home only for a special occasion, like the cable companies come or something like that. Going forward, I think the offices are going to be the special occasion. You're only going to commute to the office or fly to the office when you have a large contingent of people coming in and you need to wine and dine them or something like that. And the second order of this is people that are only living in expensive cities because of their vocation. When their lease comes up for renewal, they're going to cast a glance at places like Wyoming and Idaho and Iowa 
maybe even Vietnam and Cambodia, far flung places, because now you have them thinking of what could life look like if I decouple geography and work? I still want to work really hard and contribute this knowledge, but I can go to a place with better air quality, better schools, better opportunity to actually invest in a smaller community where I can see real impact. And I think that's just going to have massive, massive uh, societal impacts. People are really taking this time to consider how tightly their identity has been woven into work now that they're home and it's they're, they've become something more than just whatever the office life has defined them as. I think that's really healthy. I think a lot of people may have have intertwined those two things too tightly in the past. And now it's a forcing function to really ask yourself, you know, it's, you aren't just your work. You're more than your work. And what can that look like when you can do that job from, from anywhere? Right. Right. And, and as you said, there's so many, you know, kind of secondary benefits in terms of, you know, traffic and infrastructure and, and, and the environment and, and all kinds of things. And, and the other thing I think yeah. that's interesting, what you said, 80, 20, I would, I think that was pretty generous. I wouldn't give it 20 percent, but yeah. if people, you know, even in this hybrid steps, um, you know, do more once a week, twice a week, once every two weeks, right? The, the impact on the infrastructure and people's lives uh, is going to be, Huge, but I wanted to, to drill on on something as we go into kind of this hybrid mode uh, at some point in time. And you talked about it, I thought it was fascinating about, about the norms and really coming at it from a work from home first or work from anywhere first. You're very good at specifying home. anywhere doesn't mean home. Could be the library, could be the coffee shop, could be an office, could be a WeWork, could be wherever. Um, exactly. But you talked about the new norms and the one I thought was really interesting, which probably impacts a lot of teams is when some of the team is in the office and some of the team isn't, the typical yeah. move, right, is to have everyone in the office go into the conference room, we sit around one big screen. So you got like five people sitting around one table and then you got a bunch of heads, uh, you know, on Zoom. And you said, you know, no, let's all be remote. So if we just happen to be sitting at our desk, we're sitting at our desk. If we happen to be in the office, that's okay. But really normalize and, and like we saw the movement from cloud go to cloud and eh, to cloud first, why not cloud? And then, you know, kind of mobile, and eh, does it work good on mobile? No, 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 it has to work. It's mobile first. Really this shift to not, can it be done at home, but tell me why it shouldn't be done at home. A really exactly. different kind of opening position as to how people deploy resources and think about staffing and assigning teams. It's like turning the whole thing upside down. Completely upside down. I think remote first, to your point, is going to be the default going forward. I think we're just one or two quarters away from major CEOs sitting on the hot seat on CNBC when it's a, their turn for quarterly earnings. And they're going to have to justify why they're spending what they spend on real estate. Because if you're spending a billion dollars a year on real estate, you could easily deploy that to more people, more R&D. Once that question is asked in mass, that is when you're going to see the, the next phase of this, where you really have to justify, even from a cost standpoint, why are you spending so much? Why are you tying so much of your business results to geography? And the thing about remote first is that it's not a us versus them. A lot of what we've learned in GitLab and how we operate so efficiently, they work really well for remote teams and they are remote first, but they would work just as well in an office. We attach a Google Doc agenda to every single business meeting that we have so that there's always an artifact, there's always some documented thread on what happened in a meeting. Now this would work just as well in a co-located meeting. Who wouldn't want to have a meeting where it's not just in one ear and out the other? You're going to give the time to the meeting, you might as well get something out of it. And so a lot of these remote, force for, remote first forcing functions, they do help remote teams work well, but I think it's especially important for hybrid teams so look, offices aren't going to vanish overnight. A lot of these companies are going to have some part of their company return to the office when travel restrictions are lifted. I think the key here is that it's going to be a lot more fluid. You're never going to know on a day-to-day -day basis who is coming into the office and who is not. So you need to optimize for everyone being out of the office. And then if they just so happen to be there, they just so happen to be there. Right, right. So before we... I want to get into one little nitty gritty subject in terms of investment into the home office. You know, we're, we're doing, we're 100% remote interviews now uh, on theCUBE, right? We used to go to pretty much, probably 80% of our business was at events or at people's offices or, or, or facilities. Now it's all dial in. You talked a lot about, you know, people need to flex a little bit on enabling people to invest in the little bits of pieces of infrastructure for their home office that they just don't have, you know, the same setups and, you know, 
you talk about multiple monitors, a comfortable chair, a good light, you know, that there's a, a few things that you can invest in, not tremendous amounts of money, but a couple hundred bucks here and there to make a big difference on the homework environment and how people should think about making that investment into a, a, a big monitor that they don't see. It's not sitting at the desk in the office. 100%. Look, if you're coming from a co-located space, you're probably sitting in a cube that costs five, ten, maybe $20,000 put together. You might not notice that, but it's not cheap to build cubicles in a high rise. And if you go to your home and you have nothing set up, I would say it's on the people group to think really hard about being more lax and more lenient about spending policy. People need multiple monitors. You need a decent webcam. You need a decent microphone. You need a chair that isn't going to kill your back. You want to help people create healthy, ergonomic, sustainable workspaces in their home. This is the kind of thing that will inevitably impact productivity. You force someone to just be hunched over on their couch in front of a 13-inch laptop. I mean, what kind of productivity do you really expect from that? That's not a great long-term solution. And I think the people group actually has a higher burden to bear all the way around, even when it comes to making sure teams feel like teams and they have the atmosphere to connect on a meaningful level. It comes down to the people group to not letting that just go to spontaneity. You want to have a happy hour and virtually, you're going to have to put a calendar invite on people's calendar. You're going to create topical channels in Slack for people to talk about things other than work. Someone's going to have to do that. They don't just happen by default. So from hardware all the way to communication, the people group really needs to use this opportunity to think about, okay, what can we unlock in this new world? Right. And I'm, I'm glad you said the people group and not the resources group because they're not coal or steel. Or fact no, if anything, <laughs> if anything, COVID has humanized this in a way, and I think it's actually a, a really big silver lining where we're all now peering into each other's homes. And it is glaringly obvious that we're all humans first, colleagues second. Right. And of course, that's always been the case. But there's something about a sterile, co-located work environment. You check a piece of you at the door and there's, just, you know, you just kind of get down to business. And like, wh why is that? We have technology at our fingertips. We can be humans with each other. And that's going to actually encourage more empathy. And as, as we've seen at GitLab, more empathy leads to better business results. It leads to more meaningful connections. You know, I have people, friends located all over the world that I feel like I have a closer bond with, a closer, more intimate connection with than a lot of people I've met in the office. Because you, to some degree, you don't know who they really are. You don't know what they really love and what Right, right. All right, Darren, so before I let you go, and again, thank you for the time of the conversation. I'm sure everyone is calling you up and I, I just love the open source ethos and, and the sharing, you know, it's made such a huge impact on the technology world and, you know, second order impacts that a lot of people take advantage. Again, give, uh, give us the place that people can go for the playbook so they can come and leverage some of the resources. And again, thank you guys for publishing them. Absolutely, so we are, uh, we're open source. We try to open source all of our learnings on remote. So go to allremote.info, that will redirect you right into the All Remote section of the GitLab Handbook, all of which is open source. Right at the top, you can download the remote playbook, which is the PDF we talked about. Download that, it takes you through all of our best information on getting started and thriving as a remote team. And just under that, there's a lot of comprehensive guides on how we think about everything, from how we operate synchronously, to how we handle meetings, and even hiring and compensation. So, allremote.info, and of course, you're welcome to reach out to me on Twitter, I'm at Darren Murray. All right, well thanks a lot, Darren, and uh, I, I find it somewhat ironic that you have a, a, a jetliner over your shoulder uh, waiting for the lockdown and the quarantine to end so you can get back on that airplane, um, and, and, and we're looking forward to that day. Can't wait, man, I miss, I miss the airplanes. I, I told someone the other day, I uh, never thought I'd say I miss having a middle seat at the very back of the airplane with someone reclined into my nose. But honestly, I can't wait. Take me in. I think you'll be fighting people for that seat uh, in another <laughs> month or so. All right. Thanks, for, thanks a lot, Darren. Absolutely. Take care, all. All right. He's Darren. I'm Jeff. You're watching theCUBE from Palo Alto Studios. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.